Welcome to this special series of in-depth political interviews with Christians from the major political parties who are standing in this year's general election on Thursday the 8th of June. And in today's programme, I'm interviewing Sid Cordell from the Christian People's Alliance. Sid, welcome to this special series of programmes we're doing to cover the election. Thank you very much. Uh, Sid, you, you are the leader of the Christian People's Alliance uh, and you make no mistake about being a Christian. It's, it's labelled all over your party. Um, but why, as a Christian, did you decide to get involved in politics and why didn't you join one of the other major parties? Well, I've always been interested in politics all my life. Uh, even when at school, I was uh, on the school council. And when I went to university, in the space of the first few months, I was on the union council and then later on standing for union president and just standing as a Christian. But when I left university, I felt I had to join one of the main parties then. I actually joined the Conservative Party, which I was in for some 27 years. But the time came when I no longer felt happy within the Conservative Party. And that was particularly when Ian Duncan Smith came under a vicious attack around 2003. And at that time, the Conservative Party changed its whole approach. Uh, up to then, they'd been very much pro-family. Ian Duncan Smith had a three-line whip against homosexual couples being allowed to adopt children. Um, but after he was removed, Michael Howard came in and said, we've got to change our policies. The buzzword was modernisation, and out went all the Christian family values. And in came, eventually, same-sex marriage through the Conservative Party. So I could no longer be a Christian fully committed to the Conservative Party. And God closed that door and opened at the same time another door with the Christian People's Alliance. And I had to go where God was leading me. And I believe God has led me into this party and God has led me to become its leader. And I'm happy just doing whatever he says. So what impact can um, CPA make on this general election, knowing with our political system it's a majority first past the post? Uh, and in terms of a kind of proportional representation system, maybe the CPA would, would do better. But what, what are your genuine, realistic hopes to achieve uh, during this election campaign? Well, for us, this is part of a process. In the last general election in 2015, we had 17 candidates. In this election, we've got 31. We've been standing in most of the key by-elections recently in the last parliament, and all of it's seeking to get our message across. The aim is to get to a position where we have 500 candidates. So we really are an option for everybody in the whole country. That's the aim. And once we reach that aim, then it's possible for us to get elected into government. But you, we have to go through this process. I mean, the Conservative Party has been going for, what, 150 years. The Labour Party has been going for about 120 years. Uh, and the, the, the Liberal Party in, obviously started also about 120, 130 years ago. And you can't expect to be a, a, a non existent party and suddenly in a few years be, be uh, running the country. We've got to go through the process and I'm encouraging all the Christian People's Alliance candidates to think long term. It's not just about this election, it's about a process and what I want in this election is for us to move forward, get more votes than we had last time, get more support, get more TV and uh, radio interviews and get more uh, access to the, to the uh, written media as well. Uh, Sid, this uh, general election has been dubbed the uh, Brexit general election. It's the first general election since the British people had the historic opportunity to uh, vote to leave in last year's referendum. Um, what are your party's policies in terms of Brexit and uh, negotiating our exit from the European Union? Okay, well, we largely support the approach that Theresa May has been taking. In our 2014 European Parliamentary Manifesto, we actually said we don't believe the European Union is going to give us a good deal when it comes to leaving. We believe it's going to be necessary to revoke the European Communities Act 1972 and to leave. And after we've left, then we can effectively negotiate and at that point we'll probably get a good deal. Now, we were saying that before any other party was even thinking about the leaving process. But what we were saying then is basically what Theresa May has done. She's now going through with a negotiating process and she's said quite clearly, no deal is better than a bad deal. She's willing to accept a no deal position and that's the right position to be in. The Labour Party position by contrast is complete nonsense. They're saying we've got to have all the benefits of the single market and the customs union and we must not leave the European Union without a deal. Now, when you go into negotiations, if you're the Labour Party, 
we've got to have a deal, we've got to stay in the single market and in the customs union, then the European Union can effectively make whatever demands they want. This is the price and they've got to pay it or, or else they'll stay in. Now, the, the, the approach the Conservative Party is taking, which is the, part, the approach that we've been taking, is unless you give us a good, reasonable deal, then we're going to leave anyway and we'll leave and trade on the World Trade Organization rules. Now, our main advantage with the European Union is financial services. London's the biggest financial centre in the world. There's no tariffs on financial services. See, the people that are going to pay the tariffs are going to be the German car makers. And, and they actually export 89 billion per year more to us than we export to them. So if we've got tariffs on all these manufactured goods, they're going to pay a lot more than we pay. And we can actually afford to pay all the tariffs for our exporters and they'll still be better off. So it's not a disaster at all to leave without a deal. And that's what people have got to understand and that's the only way effectively to leave and able to, uh, to, to secure our borders, to able to set our own agenda, to able to have trade deals with India, with China, with Russia, with, with any countries elsewhere in the world. So, um, Sid, if, if you were Prime Minister, there, there's two major problems you've got to deal with in terms of negotiating uh, Britain's exit from the European Union. One is that individual EU member states might be willing to come up with a good trade deal because they need to trade with us financially, it makes sense. But the other major problem is that the European Commission in particular would want to punish Britain and they are trying to punish Britain in order to send a message to the other EU members that if you leave uh, the European Union there will be consequences to pay. So surely the European Union are, and particularly the European Commission are not going to give us an easy ride in these negotiations. What would your strategy be to come No, Absolutely, it's, a, it's what I've been trying to say that we don't believe that they will offer us a good deal. But it actually interestingly enough it gets worse than that because we've spoken to some people who were involved in the negotiations between Greece and Germany when, or, or Greece and the European Union it was, but all the negotiators were German, funnily enough, um, over the problems that Greece, the financial problems that Greece had. And Greece said when they were negotiating with the European Union, nothing was ever reliable. They thought that they'd achieve something one day in the negotiations, but next day the negotiators came back and said, no, I'm sorry, it's not agreed. Because you've got 27 states that you're trying to negotiate with. So even the people that you're negotiating with, you might think, OK, we've got an agreement there, but then they go back to the people that are pulling their strings and they say, no, no, you can't agree that. So then they come back and they start again at square one the next day. The whole negotiating process is going to be incredibly difficult. And I'm quite certain the only way ultimately will literally be to walk away, as I've said. Uh, in terms of the general election so far, uh, leadership is being um, covered as one of the major issues in this election and, and certainly Theresa May as our Prime Minister has set her stall out uh, on the issue of uh, leadership. Now in terms of your leadership of uh, the Christian People's Alliance, what qualities do you bring uh, as a candidate in this election? Okay, well, I believe that what I've got, which no other party leader has got, is a relationship with God. And the key thing is that we believe in the importance of prayer and seeking God and, and asking the question, God, what is your will in this situation? And as I've said before, to me, one of the key things is what Jesus said. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And it also says in James, if anyone lacks wisdom, let them ask God. Now, if you can hear God's voice, you can say, God, what is your heart? What is your heart in this situation for the nation? What, which way do you want us to go? And if you can hear God and you can say, yes, I'm going to go down that way. Now, I believe this isn't just about Christians voting for the Christian People's Alliance. I believe the whole world should be able to see this party's got the best policies because is coming from God and that's where the policies are coming from and that's where the power lies in what we're putting forward. Uh, in, in, in terms of um, your party's position on families and also on marriage, um, what proposals do you have to protect the uh, nuclear family uh, and, and also marriage as well in this country which has very much been under threat certainly over the last 30-40 years? Okay, well we believe we need some sort of drastic action. And the drastic action that we propose is to have a £10,000 grant on the occasion of your first marriage, provided you go for at least five sessions of marital training. 
and another grant of £5,000 on the birth of the first child if the child is born within wedlock, provided you go for at least three sessions or, or five sessions of training in child rearing. Now that training will be available for everyone, not just for people that are married, but nevertheless that's important. Now we want to get to a situation where it's foolish not to get married and take advantage of these grants. And there's some other things as well, like a transferable tax allowance. At the moment, there's just a £1,000 transferable tax allowance. We would make the tax allowance totally transferable. So if a mother or father is at home looking after the child, then the whole of their 10,600 tax-free allowance could be transferred to the parent that's working. And it's interesting enough, the Labour Party says we can't even cope with a £1,000 transferable allowance. They're going to abolish that. That's, that's how, mu how little they support marriage. But also there's something else which is the um, capital gains tax on property. At the moment, if you've got two people that, that um, come together, if they don't get married, then both, if the, both the man and the woman has a property, then both of those properties have a nil capital gains tax allowance. When they get married, they suddenly only have one capital gains tax allowance. Now, we would say every married couple has to have a double capital gains tax allowance to avoid that anomaly. We don't want any situation where people are better off not getting married. We've got to support marriage and we've got to change the whole culture of society. That's our aim. And uh, Sid, one of the major issues that uh, many of our viewers are concerned about and something that you'll be very aware of uh, is the growing uh, political marginalisation of Christians in politics and also in society as well, to the extent that many Christians fear fearful of sharing their faith in the public workplace uh, for fear of uh, persecution, uh, for fear that they will be dismissed from their job, even praying with uh, you know, potential patients or with work colleagues or for sharing a Bible scripture. Um, what proposals has your party got in place that help to protect these Christian freedoms that have been so fundamental to our way of life for centuries in this nation? Well, obviously, if we were in power, then there would be complete freedom to uh, change your faith or whatever. We, we, we wouldn't be persecuting Muslims in the way that Muslims persecute Christians in other countries. We believe in complete freedom, freedom of religion, and we want open debate, open debate on, on all the issues in, in relation to what is right and what is wrong, so people can see for themselves whether, whether Christianity is right or not. Uh, in terms of your um, economic uh, policies, um, for example, where will the majority of your, your budget and your spending going? Knowing that, uh, for example, that uh, we're not quite in the same austerity measure as we were back in 2010, but certainly there's a great need to balance the budget uh, as well as to reduce the deficit. Um, how would your party go about um, reducing both balancing the books and reducing the deficit? Well, we want to introduce a new turnover tax, which is um, described as a modern way of taxing, because there are so many organisations at the moment that just simply aren't paying tax, like Facebook and Google and Starbucks and organisations like this. Now, all these organisations basically send their profits abroad. And because of the double taxation rules, you can't pay capital gains tax in the UK and also pay it in, a, in another country. So they, so they basically pay no tax. Now what we want is a turnover tax. So all these companies would pay tax, it'd be set at about 5%. And all the companies that do pay corporation tax would have their corporation tax offset against the turnover tax. So they would then have an advantage and we'd have a far more level playing field. And we believe that that tax will bring in billions. I mean, one assessment is about 50 billion, but we're talking about enormous amount of money that will come in through that tax. And it will certainly help to reduce the deficit and give us the money for other things. Now, uh, one of the reasons I believe, or we believe, that the Conservative Party has been quite successful economically since um, 2010 is, be is for two reasons. One is capital investment, and the other is the reductions in corporation tax, which have gone down to 19% now from, from, from where it was. Now, we believe it's those two things that have really given the economy a boost. And you see, you might think, OK, we've still got problems. But in 2010, we had a deficit that was going at 150 billion a year. Our deficit is now rising at 50 billion a year. OK, it's still too much but it's come down substantially. And we want to see that process continue and we want to see it down to, to nil because debt is obviously a, a, a very bad thing. But you see, what we must not do is start just 
drastically increasing corporation tax. The Labour Party have said they're going to put it up to 26%. That would be a complete disaster. We've got to maintain low business taxation and we've got to obtain, uh, uh, retain capital investment. Those are the key engines for growth in the economy. And so as we get the growth, we can spend more on public services. We want to see more money spent on NHS and on education, but it can't be done without creating the wealth because we've got to, we've got to be business friendly. Uh, in terms of education, it's pretty clear to see that uh, our standards are slipping. Uh, we're not failing to keep up with the, um, the standards of education in Southeast Asia and those uh, growing economies where the skill gap is, is actually widening. Um, what are your plans in terms of education, in terms of raising standards uh, and also preparing the next generation for the challenges, certainly the high-tech challenges, facing this nation in the 21st century? Okay, well, our main policy is that we want stability. You see, I think it's what's tended to happen over the last few decades, if I could put it like that, is that we've had a situation where we had grammars and secondary moderns, then we moved to comprehensive education, then we moved back to the government now says they want more grammars, then we bring in academies, then we change the, 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 um, the um, exam system, they're trying to change the exam system now to a more European style exam system. Now, some changes have been needed. I mean, we've needed the national curriculum, that's been a good change. We need to have some sort of tests or at least assessment, if not tests that goes on in classrooms so we know have some record of how standards are performing all changes aren't bad but changing the school systems uh, has been very had a very negative effect on our education and we want stability that's our first thing and we believe as we have stability then every school can then have more money because it's not going to in the, the resources aren't going to change school systems so um, that's important. Now we believe every school should at least have enough money to cover the increase in staff wages and the increase in costs. What was happening at the moment is that schools have got a flat budget in money terms. They haven't got a reduction in money terms, they've got a flat budget in money terms. So that means they've got no money to pay increased staff wages or increased costs. So a lot of schools are having to lay off staff. That is completely unacceptable. Uh, in, in terms of uh, home ownership, for example, uh, particularly in London and the South East, it's extremely difficult for first time buyers to actually buy their own home because of the housing crisis. Uh, you know, uh, houses are really pretty much unaffordable in, in London. So how do you plan to fulfill the dreams and aspirations of so many people wanting to actually buy their own home? Yeah, we, we, we obviously need to do more house building, but we've also got to look at some of the reasons behind all this increased demand in housing. And one of the reasons, unfortunately, is the breakup of families. And because obviously if you've got a husband and wife living together with their children and the husband and wife break up, you've now got uh, a need for two houses instead of a need for one house. And the reality is at the moment, if you're 16, you've got less than a 50% chance of living with two parents. That's an enormous number of additional houses required because of the breakup of families. So by addressing the, that breakup and doing whatever we can to halt it and to change the culture of society, we believe it will also reduce the housing demand. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to build houses, we should. But we do need to look at the underlying reason why this demand has increased so much. Um, what's your party's position on the uh, immigration crisis? Because one of the major reasons why so many uh, British people voted to leave the European Union was because of this uncontrolled uh, immigration into the country. Well, our, our primary uh, aim is to believe we should help people where they are and by and large the people that have travelled thousands of miles are probably the most capable and most able. See what a lot of people don't realise is there's actually 2.8 million refugees in Turkey, there's a million refugees in Lebanon, there's 650,000 refugees in Jordan. So altogether that's over 4 million refugees that are there in, in countries surrounding Syria. Now. We can't just say, we'll open our doors and they can all come here. Uh, 850,000 refugees have actually gone into the European Union, but that is still only 20% of the total. I mean, we're talking about taking, taking maybe 40,000 refugees. That's, that's less than 1% of the total. Your party proposes a number of sensible and some very uh, good ideas, but I have to disagree with you on your position on China. And even Jeremy Corbyn, who actually opposes our nuclear deterrent, has had to include this in his manifesto. Um, so why does your party continue to support uh, a position that is actually anti-Trident, which means that effectively we wouldn't have a nuclear uh, deterrent? 
Okay, well, if you think about it, our policy is the right policy. I mean, I have to admit, when I was in the Conservative Party, I said, yeah, we need Trident, we've got to defend our citizens, and so on and so forth. But then you think, could I, as a Christian, if I was running this country, say, I'm going to press a nuclear button and I'm going to kill millions of people? I could never, never press a nuclear button as a Christian. And then you have to say, well, is there some alternative? Is there an alternative that we can use where we can protect our citizens without killing millions of people? And then we actually see what's happening. Well, first, what's happening in Israel. You see, in, in Israel, they've got three different types of, uh, of defensive weapon system now where they're shooting down incoming missiles. And they've been incredibly successful with up to 95% of all incoming missiles now are being shot down. And then you've got a threat from North Korea to the United States. And what's the first thing that Donald Trump does? Puts into South Korea a defensive missile shield to shoot down any missiles that North Korea might want to start firing at the United States. Now, we haven't got that. All we've got is the threat that if you, if you bomb one of our cities, we'll bomb one of yours. Now, that sort of policy may have had credence when the only country that had nuclear weapons that was a threat to us was Russia. But now we've got Pakistan with nuclear weapons, we've got possibility of Iran with nuclear weapons. It's, 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 it's proliferating around the world. It's no longer, it just, you know, with, with countries like Pakistan and, and Iran, they're not going to um, stop firing nuclear weapons at us because we might fire one back at them. The only way we can properly defend ourselves is to have a missile shield. And we've also got to develop technology, which I'm assured is available and is growing, where you can actually lock on to incoming missiles and divert them into the ocean. Now, when that technology is properly working, that is what will really solve the nuclear problem. Yeah, but but the, the great danger of what you're proposing um, is essentially saying that we would have no defence. We're saying to rogue regimes that we have no nuclear weapons, we've got rid of them. Uh, therefore, we're free to attack. And even with systems like the Iron Dome, they're not 100% uh, effective. And all it takes is for one nuclear missile to be fired at, at London and it goes through and you literally kill millions of people. They're not nice weapons. They're horrendous weapons that has the capacity to destroy the entire planet 10 times over. I get that. But at the same time, this is an important defence deterrent we need against those regimes. And even regimes like Tehran and others who are developing nuclear weapons realise that if, they, if, for example, nuclear weapons are targeted at their cities, then there's also a reluctance to actually fire them because they'll be afraid of actually losing their regime and their power base. That's why the, it acts as a deterrent. Uh, just moving on to the, um, an, another issue, really. I mean, what's your party's stance on the rise of Islamic inspired terrorist attacks that we've seen across Europe over the last couple of years. And uh, we've also witnessed here in London with a Westminster terror attack in March. What is your party doing to confront the Islamist terrorist attack that we're seeing today? OK, well, obviously, it's very good what the um, security forces are doing and they've done a marvellous job and what they're doing in, uh, in seeking to monitor terrorists and so on and so forth is excellent. We believe the actual core, what is going to stop all this, is going to come through debate. You see, the weapons of Christianity, the, or the big weapon of Christianity, is actually debate. You know, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He didn't say, go into all the world and kill people. Now, it's, as we debate effectively, I believe we can show that Christianity is the truth and Islam is a false religion. Now, the key thing for me is the fact that nobody has ever been to a Quranic paradise with virgins and rivers of wine and loads of food. I mean, you can put into YouTube visions of heaven and hell, and there's hundreds of them. There's not one person who's had a vision of a Quranic paradise. Now, and by contrast, there are actually many, many people that Muslims that have died, gone to heaven and seen Jesus and come back and describe the story. Even one Islamic State fighter who died on the battlefield, he was picked up by some, some Christians, and they, all they were going to do was bury him, but he came back to life and he said, while I was dead, I actually had to live through the experience of the people whose heads I cut off, of what it was like. He said, I'll never forget it. But he said, I stood before Jesus and I saw Jesus and now I've come back and I want to be a Christian. Now, that's just one example. There's many, many examples like that. Now, when the message gets through, which it will do with the internet, that this Islamic paradise does not exist. That will stop people killing themselves and it will mean that is Islamic radicalism will disappear off the face of the earth. The only thing that's sustaining Islamic radicalism is ignorance. 
frankly. Uh, moving on to an issue that's very important to myself and not, uh, very important to a lot of our viewers is, is Israel, um, particularly Israel's security concerns. Now, what is your party's position on protecting Israel, uh, security, uh, but also on the rise of the boycott, divestments and sanctions movement known as the BDS, and also the dangers of the international community trying to impose a unilateral Palestinian state on Israel? Our position is that we support Israel. We believe that they've been, they've suffered unprovoked attacks in, in 1948, in 1967, 1973. And as a result of those unprovoked attacks, they gained some territory. Now, it's not going to solve the problem here in Israel by having a Palestinian state in the West Bank. There simply isn't enough space. I mean, there's something like uh, uh, over two and two and a half million Palestinians now in the West Bank, but there's also another two and a half million Palestinians in Jordan. There's another two million Palestinians in Israel. Now, that's seven million. Now, if you're going to say this is the Palestinians' home state, let them all go into the West Bank. Sorry, there's just simply not enough space. Now, to us, the right answer is to have a Palestinian state in the East Bank in Jordan. That is the right answer. There, that's where there is the space. Now, if the international community invests in that and encourages the Palestinians to live in the, in, in the East Bank of the Jordan, that is going to be the solution that will really bring peace and will solve the problem for everyone. And uh, finally, Sid, uh, do you have a, a, a reason why our viewers should vote for the Christian People's Alliance on Thursday, the 8th of June in this year's general election? Well, our fundamental reason is because we believe that the policies we have are the best policies for the nation. We will uphold marriage through the tax system, which no other party will. We will protect children inside their mother's womb, uh, which no other party will. And we will protect Christians who are being persecuted around the world, and we will encourage open debate, as I've said, in our universities, on public television, as to what is the truth. People will be fearlessly allowed to express their opinions in an atmosphere of freedom and without any threats. And we believe that is the right approach. At the same time, we will support business. We will encourage business. We'll encourage wealth creation. We'll encourage wealth creation so we can afford to spend money on our services like the health service and education. And that is the right approach, caring for the poor, but at the same time providing the wealth. And we may not win loads of seats in this election, but that is an agenda which I hope that your viewers, if they possibly can, will vote for. And I pray that in future they will have a party to vote for if they haven't now. They'll have a Christian People's Alliance candidate to vote for. And in the end, we will come to a place where we can run this country because I believe we've got the best policies for the country. Uh, Sid Cordo, I just want to thank you so much for joining me on this special series of programmes we're doing to cover the British general election. Thank you. Thank you.